good morning, everyone. As you know, this is a live streamed uh, presentation. Um, I guess I must introduce my myself. My name is C. Paul Pichan. I'm the chair of council, uh, and I chair the selection committee. In welcoming you, I know that uh, there are other people who are not able to be here but are watching this process closely. Uh, I would like to extend greetings to them as well. Um, this is a very important process as we are looking to find somebody to lead uh, this institution and help us navigate through the exciting times and enable it to live to its full potential. Um, we have two candidates, and we arrived at two candidates after a very detailed and thorough search process. And I'd like to thank uh, the university community uh, and those that uh, were able to make suggestions, nominate candidates, and I can assure you every candidate that was nominated, we reached out to and um, tried what all we could to get them to participate in the process. Um, and of course, others applied independently in their own right. We, as you know, extended the process of uh, a search to just make sure that nobody felt that um, uh, nobody that we could bring into the process was left out. I think this, it would be fair to say that the selection committee satisfied itself that we did all we could to um, find appropriate candidates uh, for this process. Fortunately, we have uh, two uh, leaders of the, in the higher education sector that they've shown themselves interested in this. So this process is going to be about a presentation. We've invited them to do a presentation on the topic that I understand has been circulated, but just for completeness, let me restate it. Positioning UCT as a world-class institution between a rapidly changing world and local imperatives for radical transformation. So um, they will present in respect of that for 15 minutes exactly. Um, and each one of them will be stopped dead on time, 15 minutes, so that we are not seen to be favoring anyone by allowing them extended time of presentation. So all the presentation will be 15 minutes exactly. Please note, this is not an interview, and I, I, I'm very pleased that all of you could be here. All the questions, and you'll be invited after their presentations to ask questions. Um, and please be brief and to the point. As you can see, there are many of us. Um, and I would encourage you to try and ask one question, if you can. Uh, giving due regard to others. So don't ask, don't interview them. Um, remember that you've entrusted that responsibility with the selection committee. So, uh, and the selection committee, as you know, is constituted, drawn from various constituencies of the university. So I really would want to encourage you to please uh, invite them to elaborate on various aspects of their presentations. Uh, and you may comment on some aspects of their presentations if you so wish, but comments should not be an alternative presentation, please. If you make an alternative presentation, um, I will try and politely stop you from doing so. As you know, we, we, we also use this process to invite you to uh, send us suggested questions that we might uh, overlook in our interview process, which will happen tomorrow. So tomorrow we'll have interviews which, with, with the two candidates. Uh, so if there are questions that you think we should ask arising from 
either the presentations here today or the information that you have on the candidates or um, uh, whatever you think is important for the candidates to, um, to talk about. Okay, so the question and answer session uh, will, be only, will be 15 to 20 minutes. Uh, I, I hope everybody has received the abbreviated CVs of all the of the two candidates, and has had an, an occasion to to look at it and see how impressive these are. All the stuff you understand, the selection committee, please send it to Siko, uh, whose details are available on Vula on announcement. On the announcement, yes, yes. Um, at uct.az.za. It says here on the announcement. Great. Um, there are people who are standing there at the back. There are seats here. Oh, so they say that uh, they are assigned to stand. Is there any clarification or questions that anybody might have about the process? Are we happy? Um, Everybody is happy? Okay. Um, I, I pretend to know how to do these things, but actually Siko tells me what to do. Is there anything else, Siko, that... Uh, am I good? morning, everyone. Um, just for recording purposes, please wait to receive a mic before you speak so that everyone that's watching us live can catch the questions. Thank you. Um, well, we're doing very well on, mani on time management, Siko. So is, is our first candidate here. So are we able to invite her to join us? OK, thank you very much. Okay, this is uh, Professor Vivian Lavac, our first candidate. Uh, she's going to do her presentation. She may stand, she may walk through in between there, whatever her style is. Uh, and I'm sure you uh, are, are happy to, to have her here. And we're pleased that uh, you've shown interest in our institution and uh, seen fit to apply. So your presentation is going to be 15 minutes exactly, uh, five minutes before the end of your time. Siko here will show you, uh, will draw your attention to the fact that you only have five more minutes. At the end of that, she will indicate that uh, your time is up. Um, she will be assertive in doing that, uh, but not disrespectful. So if you could cooperate, please. Uh, so, so we count on you to cooperate. But, but, but welcome. Thank you very much. We look forward to your presentation. Over to you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, and good morning to everybody here. Um, maybe this is the first remark to say that I'm not taking this lightly. I'm deeply honored to be one of two candidates that can present here today. Um, I found it quite ironic when I look at the mountains and I thought, who would have thought that the child that was born at the foot of the Tsitsikama Mountains can come and present at the foot of these majestic mountains. So thank you very much, Chair, Selection Committee, and all the colleagues here. I'm also very indebted to, strangely enough, um, a lot of support from my UWC colleagues, as well as from here, and um, I would in advance like to say thank you for that. Always with technology. Which one? Which 
to see. I'll just enter. You're all familiar with the topic, positioning UCT as a world-class institution between a rapidly changing world and local imperatives for radical transformation. So one of the first things I thought about, what would be those characteristics? What would be the markers of a world-class institution? And you know in the literature there are at least three of them. The one is that you should have excellent talent, whether it's staff and your students, and that's one of the first markers or the characteristics. But the second one is that literature actually refers to abundance of resources. So that whatever your strategy would be, that you would have enough resources both to ensure a quality learning environment for students, but also to make sure that you can have cutting edge research. And then the third one is an interesting one about governance. That your governance should actually be such that it enables the kind of strategies and the position that you would like to have um, globally. There's also some other factors, and, and I thought about UCT, and I thought, okay, it's tick, tick, tick so far. Location, age, and then the political setup, whether it ensures internally, as well as the political setup externally, whether it ensures um, freedom of expression, and especially in our context, academic freedom. Now, when I look at the profile, I'm not going to give you a data-driven uh, presentation today because we're going to get stuck on whether it's 22% or whether it's 26%. So what I'm going to do is going to be a high-level positioning of the world class and then juxtaposing that with the global, the local factors, as well as radical um, transformation. So just in the face of the, all those characteristics, I think we don't need to argue that UCT is already world class. If you look at the level of research that's being conducted at this university, your African focus, the, the way in which through the research and through the quality learning that takes place here, um, you actually make a difference in the world. Um, if you look at your location, the age, all those things, I think we can agree, and your global, ranking, your standing locally, as well as on the continent. So with that in mind, my, in positioning UCT, I would not want to change your strategy that got you to world class. Maybe tweak that somewhat, and then especially in light of some of the local and the global factors. Right. One of the things is that, we, that we all know is that change is inevitable. Change is constant. So what would 2018 and beyond bring? This list is by no means an exhaustive list. And what I will do is to, to mention some of them, and if there's time afterwards during questions and answers session, then maybe we can engage. I think I would like to stand here. Maybe we can engage a bit more in some of these factors. The external factors within South Africa are quite important. When we look at the higher education um, landscape, and I've tried to list them. There are actually quite a few ways in which maybe some would argue slowly but surely autonomy is being eroded. The compliance factor is very high. If you think of the fact that the Attorney General now sits on our finance committees of council, you have things such as the fact that we have to have annual reporting um, and actually quite strenuous reporting besides all the grants that we're reporting on. Then we have all these before performance indicators. We actually sign an enrollment mandate with the government that sets out the mandate for the university. Lots of policy interventions. Look at 2013, post-school sector. You can uh, think of things such as um, differentiation. And then, um, of course, transformation as well. But we'll get to that one. Fee-free education, we will have to work around a way around this. It's by no means clear, and I think one of the things I want to mention is that I feel that it, will, it might have some effect on our admissions and maybe our enrollment plans going forward, as well as the funding. Um, and where, Because all of a sudden, maybe the kinds of students that anecdotally, and sorry, Petty, someone in the law faculty said, no, we don't accept those kind of students. We send them to U UWC. But now those kind of students are going to be on your doorstep. Don't worry, it's not you. Uh, <laughs> they're going to be at your doorstep because they would have been financially excluded. And that takes quite a change in the way in which 
one would be used to whoever sitting in front of the class of you. I might come back to some of these, but political and socioeconomic changes, who would have thought in South Africa that we would once again have a bloodless revolution? A change of God? Almost um, evidence that our constitution is, our constitutional democracy is working. And within the others that I'm listing here, maybe just the last one, the changing needs of employers and employability of our graduates. Airbnb, we are actually having to produce the kind of 21st century graduates that would need different skills. I'm a 20th century graduate. And the 21st century graduates, the, this millennium and um, this generation um, graduates are different. But the employability needs are also different. And we might even be educating our students for jobs that don't exist in future. And the question would be whether we at university are actually able to provide them with the requ requisite skills. Some of the global, I've got two um, pages on this one because I think this is quite important. We're not in isolation. And especially if your, world, your, your positioning is world class, you're always going to have to keep your eye on the global challenges. Because some of those global challenges find replicated in our society. Some of those, um, in my reflection on what happened with us since 2015, when I came to UWC, we were a new leadership team. So imagine the quick process of learning, growing up, stepping up to the plate, and it felt like actually having done five years in one year. Why? We had a baptism by fire, literally and figuratively. But if you look at the kind of global trend, if you look at the responsiveness and adaptive expertise that you now require, it's a different kind of leadership that you need. It's not the old kind of authoritarian or whether totally participative, hands off kind of charisma will only get you a certain while. And that's something that one could pick up globally as well. Funding is always an issue globally, nationally, massification of education, emerging technology is something dear to my heart. Um, one could all, it's globally of course, and this is where the competition will come in. If you still want to stay a world-class institution, to what extent is the university fit for the digital age? Are we embracing technology? Not just on a teaching and learning front, but overall, across the sector. And those are some of the things that I, I, I thought I must bring to your attention, and we can talk about that a little bit later. Brand reputation, rankings, demand for skillfulness I mentioned. I actually have it twice there. I want to end maybe the global with the, two, the last two one. There's an increasing need to connect with society, and you'll find it actually in the, in, uh, the generation Y. They do want to connect with society. And, and that you pick up globally as well. If you, and, and I think one of the things that we struggle with as higher education is the fact that we struggle to keep up with the complexities of our society. A few things I want to say about transformation because Siko very kindly mentioned five minutes. The one thing is um, it's a local. Uh, the local transformation imperatives, whether you see it within the frame of radical transformation for higher education, it is an imperative. And I just want to advance a few reasons very quickly why I think it's so important and then go straight into some of the strategies. And hopefully we'll have time and question and answer sessions to look at that. It's a constitutional and moral imperative. It's not a nice to have. It's not that we can be a little Oxford within Africa or within South Africa, it is something we have to do. Then when one look at the true meaning of transformation, it's about giving a distinctive academic character to UCT that is not only looking at Africa, and some people think Africa is out there, Africa and the rest of the world, but about transformation within the local context. And it's about substantive transformation. And substantive transformation is actually where every core function needs to be transformed. It's where 
the institution itself needs to be transformed. And I'm very happy to see that in your goals, it's actually an underlying theme that goes right through the strategic plan. Identity, what you want to do around institutional culture, it's very important because culture eats strategy any day. Within the South African higher education system, I think, and this is my argument, that we have a systemic responsibility. You see, tea can't look that way while the rest of the country might be burning, literally or figuratively. So what are some of the strategies that I have in mind? Maybe just this. Brampele, and this, I'm, I've, I'm, let me put it this way, I've lived this one. I see the interconnectedness between equity and transformation. You don't, and excellence, you don't need to make false choices. So it's a careful balance where the academic project takes central position. You need to look at the student experience. And this is the work I've been uh, doing at uh, UWC, uh, which I can maybe expand on. Rethinking the intellectual identity of UCT. From a, a white liberal institution to an institution that needs to grapple with that, with the kind of realities that we're in. A values-based institution but when you talk about inclusivity, we need to talk about authentic inclusivity. And then finally, committed collective leadership. So even if transformation sits in Proferis' office as one of her responsibilities, it means that all of us would be collectively responsible for that so that you don't step out of the water in a sense and look to the office. So what are the strategies? And I'll end with this. Your vision spoke to me. That's the reason why I applied. And I think that you can work within the vision to make some of these strategies work. What are they? I'm hoping I've got two minutes left. Leadership-driven change. I would like to start the Courageous Cafe Conversations. Yeah, I've got a methodology that really works, and it's rich. Um, and you can do it with both on the intellectual identity and institutional culture. I think we need to embed transformation, just like I said, the social justice and responsiveness within the DNA, just like African focus comes very natural for, UW, for, for UCT. <clears throat> social justice is maybe very natural for UWC, and I've learned quite a few things at that institution. Integrated transformation plan without interfering with the devolved faculty structure. It's how you bring the deans in, how you bring the HODs in, how you make sure that everybody gives an input into an integrated transformation plan. Maybe just the last slide or so. I've got experience in people planning and how you implement it and how you make transformation the absolute golden thread that goes through your, your people plan. University Fit for the Digital Age. I want to say a few things about financial sustainability, but I hope I can do that later. And a last thought to say that I think it will be doable within the current goals. 2020 is not far from here, so it would not be wise to change the goals, to change the vision, but rather see how you can have practical strategies that will make sure that transformation is just not a marketing, but an, a real lived experience. So what can you expect from me? Should I be successful? My leadership experience did not start in education. I have probably an atypical career progression, and every day I'm thankful for that. Because the many things you learn outside that education can never teach you. And I've had the opportunity to use that um, up time. So this is the, the slide I want to leave you with. I was hoping to see Ubuntu in your values. But this is the closest I could come to that. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Well done. Uh, the next candidate is uh, sitting outside, so you better close the door because he's going to take tips from this one. <laughs> Okay, um, it's time for questions, comments, answers. Uh, close meaning means, okay. 
Do you mind if I stand taking them? Please do. Please, do whatever you want. Uh, uh, if you could please, uh, in, in answering questions, if you could be brief, as you can see, we have a, a sizable audience so that we can get as many questions as, you, as we can. Do you want to take one question at a time, one or should I just get three questions and then you can answer, respond? One, and I'll try and do it be as brief. Uh, uh, let's take a cluster of three, and then you can respond. <laughs> He wants to be Good morning, Professor Levac. Good morning, Penny Andrews, Andrews, Dean of Law, since you're out at us. Uh, a quick question around transformation. People always talk about transformation or excellent versus, versus equity. It always. And I, I agree with you that actually it's not. But I want to give you a real example and maybe ask you quickly. If our numbers, let's assume our numbers are particular level, and we look at numbers for admissions. Mm -hmm. When you drop numbers, people say, well, there goes excellence. Mm -hmm. So can you tell us just very, very briefly how you can comprehensively think about that? Because that's, that's where the rubber meets the road. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Next question. Thank you. Heidi Robenheimer, a member of council. Um, I also am at Stellenbosch University, and I was wondering if you could tell us, just want to call the elephant in the room, some of us would look down on UWC. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us why we shouldn't? Okay. Thank you. W who's next? Siko. Uh, Thank you. Um, Colette Daniel from the Faculty of Health Sciences. If I heard you correctly in one of your um, slides, you spoke about not tempering with institutional structures, but how do you transform if you don't change those structures that are there? Mm. Professor Lovac. Okay. The first one on the admissions. Prof. Andrews, I actually think that if you want to do transformation once <coughs> the students apply, then it's too late. So I was thinking that um, one of your programs was about the 100 plus and the 100 and 100 plus. I think that needs to be expanded because there are very creative ways in which you can attract top class students and not only by buying them. And those would be by being directly involved in the schools, through your debating moots and all those kind of things, especially for a law faculty. So you as a faculty can actually look at ways in which you can get to different communities from your traditional ones and then start earlier. That's one. I have more, but let me just deal with the second one. Why should you not? It's an interesting one. You shouldn't look down on UWC. UWC is the best performing, historically a disadvantaged institution in the country. I think that Pretoria is quite upset that UWC is number five with them. Because who would have thought that the university that arose to just serve one particular class and one particular race would have transformed itself, pulled itself with little resources up by its bootstraps and are doing the creative things that are actually happening. Um, and I don't need to get SKA being the fact that we're working with UCT, SK, SKA in the lead, physics number one according to nature. There are many of those examples why you should not be looking down. But it's more the spirit of the place and the culture of belonging that I think one can learn from. Then um, the last one was about, can you just remind me quickly, it's um, yes, personnel. The structures. Maybe you misunderstood me. When you look at the culture, your structures always need to follow your strategy. So you do have a very devolved structure. So when it comes to, for example, an integrated um, transformation plan, some things are that important that you'll have to look at it from top down as well as from bottom, bottom up. So you're not doing away with the devolved structures of the faculties, but the way in which the faculties give input and the broader stakeholders give input into that integrated transformation plan that now has to have all the core functions reflected and strategies attached to that, including the co-curricula and the student experience, for example. And maybe in five years' time, you find that the structure is no longer suitable. And in terms of organizational um, um, strategy, you actually then change your structure slightly to fit your strategy. Otherwise, it won't work. We'll give priority in, to those that are not part of the selection committee. Um, yeah, let's start there. Okay. I'm from Tomakuna. I represent the UCT Association. 
morning. I'm Professor Magula, and I represent the UCT Association of Black Alumni. Mm -hmm. So when those students that would have been sent to UCT are now at the doorstep of UCT, to reflect the demographics of the country, how would you practically provide support for those students and staff to ensure their success and still keep the investors of UCT, funders and alumni that would probably get frustrated by the transformation, mm. continuing to invest in UCT? Okay. There are about three. Ne okay. Next question. Siko? Um, Professor Lawak, I'm always interested, as you know, I, I hold the portfolio transformation. So a lot of people have asked you, what will you do? I'm always interested in what people have done. Um, so I was wondering, in terms of your vision for transformation, if you can give us one practical example of how you've implemented it. Of course, understanding a very different context, but at UWS. Last question in front here. If you could please stand. Okay. Apologize, Chair, to the House as well. Greetings. Again, hello, Mama Lavak. Karabo Khao, SRC President. Mama, I, I, you're making very important reference to institutional culture and how that influences the student experience mm -hmm. and that how that specifically speaks to enhancing talent, but you also mentioned something about financial sustainability, and I would, I would, I think it also ties into what Umama made reference to, to say how do we then ensure that there is financial sustainability in all the projects that needs to remain in the institution. Mm. The last one, Asiko. Good morning, Maryam Hussain, uh, Executive Director, HR. Um, at the end of the day, an institution is about its people. And I see you've referred to people kinds of elements throughout your presentation. And I want to pick up on one of those issues, please. You've mentioned courageous conversations, and that's a cornerstone for change. I'd really like to get more understanding, a better understanding from you on what that is. Could you expand on that, but in particular, how that plays out in our education, please? Thanks. All right. Over to you, Prof. Lovac. All right, let me just go to the first one. The first one is about, uh, let me just check now, the student support. It is so that if you, if you do want to um, reach your transforma transformational goals, We've worked with students that are not the best, or un rather the un underprepared students. So what you need from the start is to understand the profile of the students that you're drawing. You need to understand their, their backgrounds. You need to understand um, their learning needs. So the whatever sits, I'm not sure if it sits in your portfolio, uh, Prof. Ferris, under the psychosocial well-being of the students, you need some support on that side. But very important, the academic support structures need to. So we've got, the, at the moment, quite an involved tutor system. Um, supplemental instruction also works very well. But you, the, the best thing is actually peer learning. And what we've also done, because cult, the, the context is different. So here you might have a lot of high-performing students. But at, UC, uh, at UWC, we're actually using the high-performing students to also work with students and are not performing that well. And that's where the peer learning comes from. But it, it costs money. Uh, the next one, Prof. Mag that, was, that was Prof. Magula. Then um, how do you actually do it? I'm going to take um, one quick example. Um, on the people side, okay? So what we've done, every faculty have designed a, um, a, a, a people plan for every faculty, but it's owned by the deans. And then what you then do is to make sure that you understand your natural attrition, your, um, your resignations, that's the resignations, what can you expect? You look at things such as your vacancies, your, your retirements, you look at your scare skills because it's contextual. You cannot have a one size fits all. You look at things such as your staff development because you need to have capacity development programs as well. Um, teaching replacement, the planning of sabbaticals. But very important, what I brought in at, at, at UWC was a nurturing uh, at, at persona promotions process, as well as an accelerated appointment and, and promotions process. So we are able, once we, I know you also have the new um, 
professors the NGP program, but are you able to offer them within 24 hours? So you need to look at your systems as well. So that you can, um, once you identify a candidate, if you have the, 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 the funding, that you can act on it immediately, but you also nurture those that are in the system to make sure that they can actually, it's a, and it's a, uh, about a nine months process before promotions meeting. Then on the institutional culture, yes, financial sustainability. I had a look at your figures. Um, you can't, you can't, especially if you have grant plans, and this is why I'm, you would have seen my presentation says paste. You can't do everything immediately, and that's why the context is going to be very important and the integrated plan, because what you have at the moment, on your ratios, it, it actually looks very good. But I know that the ED Finance are probably going to say to you that um, on your, the percentage of, 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 of your surplus, you're just under the benchmark. Your, your staffing has increased to about 66%. And you know that you only have about 15% on other, which is now besides the income from, from the state and, and tuition. What is very good about UCT is the way in which you only have, I think it's less than 1% bad debt provision. So where it lies is about how, in order to make this strategy work, you need to spend strategically and wisely. So you need to look at inefficiencies within the system, that's the one thing, and secondly, identify other kinds of revenue streams, inputs that you could make to, in, in order to grow your, your third stream um, funding. Courageous conversations, I know I'm rushing this. Um, this is how it works. I've, um, I've reconfigured the rector's board um, dining hall into a cafe. It can only take 24 people at a time. I use a jot, dot, jot system. So it, um, Ms. Robenheimer or Dr. Robenheimer here could be sitting next to Carabo. You don't know. So you book, you go, and then there are very set questions that we do and we do it around the round table. And you can basically just have, if you have six around the table, just four people. And then, there's a specific, um, I, I base it on the African World um, Cafe um, um, a methodology, just slightly adapted. And I found, and I take every response from there and we analyze it, but we also do the courageous conversations with the alumni. Because we felt that during the protest, our alumni were very isolated, felt on the outside, not knowing what's happening. And especially with institutional culture and in, institutional identity, they have a say and their voices should be heard. So that's on a very high level, how you do the courageous conversations. But once you've identified the trends and the thorny issues, then you have the focus group discussions and it broadens. And I can tell you people enjoy it because they feel their voices are heard. Well done. Where are we now, Siko? Mm -hmm. OK, uh, Claude Carignan, SKA Chair of Astronomy, uh, Faculty of Science. Uh, we're talking about uh, world-class university, and uh, you know that South Africa is leading what will be the largest astronomy project in South Africa, the SK. Mm -hmm. We're doing very well at UCT, I think, and UWC also. We yes. had a lot of research chair. Uh, the problem is that if we want to do transformation, research chair are for well-established researchers in their 50s, and there's no young, there's no black South African or black woman South African in their 50s that can uh, go for those positions. Couldn't, but there's plenty of young, very good black South African in their 30s, because in the last 10, 15 years, we've from a lot of mm -hmm. them. Couldn't we now try to recruit those young people in those kind of positions, which give them really mean to establish themselves? Um, next question there. Good morning, Professor Lowick. I'm Lorna Houston, the president of Convocation. My question relates to governance. I recently came across the gamble judgment which relates to UWC. And so like Professor Ferris, I'm always interested in what people have done um, because that gives us an idea of what they can do. Mm. Um, and so I'm, I'd just like to hear your comment on, on the judgment, please. Thank you. Next question, Siko. Uh, good evening, ma'am. Uh, afternoon, afternoon, I think. <laughs> yeah. uh, my name is Dinogosha Patiwe. Uh, my one is a quick one. Um, you talk about how um, transformation um, needs also to happen with the structures uh, moving forward. Um, one of the biggest things that you find at UCT is that there's a lot of resistance 
um, and you find resistance from people who are key high up in the structures that you want to bring in. So my question is, what, how then do you deal with the balance of bringing everyone in, yet at the same time not succumbing to resistance of old white people who are still racist and with us? Uh, a very quick question about the, the young people bringing them into the SKA. As long as you give them support and don't set them up for failure. Because I think that's the worst thing you can do for transformation. If you bring in someone that maybe is not quite ready, it's not doing that person. A, so I, I, it's about the balance there. If you feel that they are set like mentorship and the other kinds of support that you can give, um, fellows that are surrounding um, um, that chair, they ensure it can work. Um, but definitely not to set the person up for failure and to jeopardize the project because it's that important. Um, the gamble judgment. I think what I've learned, um, two things, is that it, it's, it's been a hard time for, for UWC in the last couple of years and I think the main issue is when an institution and especially the council does not know the boundary between executive leadership and the oversight and governance that a council needs to exercise. And when those lines start blurring, then it becomes personal, it starts looking like parliament, and if you go back to the judgment, you would see that Judge Campbell said, and there was a voice of reason, and he mentioned Professor Vivian Levac, who said that this is the wrong decision to take. But of course, council takes a decision, so go back to the judgment. And, and read about how, when you don't have the proper procedures that you're following, you can actually undo. Um, uh, because substantively there was merit, but if the procedures are not followed, uh, you're going to be in serious trouble. Uh, resistance of, of key persons. When I said about collective leadership, I included the leadership on top. Because otherwise, this is a failed project from the start, and that's going to be the one, should I be successful, that's going to be one of the first conversations. And that's why I try to say that um, you can pace the process, but you can't wish away the process. And therefore, everybody that goes into that will have to, there was one word that I didn't even mention, will have to go undergo a transformation of self and a transformation of mindset. And that will unfortunately also mean that when we go into the courageous conversations, you can't already think that someone is racist because it's a safe space and therefore you will need to open yourself up and the people in that conversation will need to open themselves up. It's not easy and therefore it's a process, not going to be done in one day. I'm going to take the uh, last two questions. Uh, one question here in front. Morning. My name is Tando Tsotsobi. I'm, Tando I'm from mm -hmm. the Office of the Vice Chancellor. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> I want to understand uh, your views about academic freedom. Um, and um, understanding that historically it's been the concept and the, uh, the focus has been about protect or safeguarding universities against government interference. Mm -hmm. Now, in the wake of corporate culture, mm -hmm. I mean capture, and, uh, and, and, and what's dominant in South Africa, is it your view or what's your view around actually also shifting the focus against potential financial and big corporates interfering or eating away academic freedom in universities by determining what is taught, mm -hmm. who teaches it, and who get taught? Mm. given the financial muscle they have. Mm. Thank you. Last one. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Lovak. Uh, my name's Dee Smythe. I'm here as a member of Senate. Um, so UCT prides itself on being a research-intensive university. Um, but over the last years, the um, budgets, the internal budgets for research have um, at best remained static. Um, and we faced a real shock at the end of last year with the, um, uh, with the NRF deciding to cut um, uh, funding to rated researchers. 
Um, so I'm wondering how you would see your role in promoting uh, research at UCT, and in particular, uh, in uh, bringing about that abundance of resources that <laughs> you mentioned in your introduction. One's words always come back to bite you, eh? <laughs> Academic freedom. This is an interesting thing. You would have seen the changes to the Education Act and all, everything that went around that. I think it's gonna, this is always going to be, firstly, also a choice of our academics, because if you, if you see this about academic freedom, we also need to make sure that our academics have the kind of judgment to know when something actually impedes the academic project. That is one side of it. Another way would be to say, and to challenge academics to ask the following, and David Cooper actually wrote a very interesting thing around it, uh, uh, around um, your engaged scholarship. <coughs> um, should, is all engaged scholarship, is it always for the social good? And I think his answer was no, around the gated communities and so on. And I think what, we, what they need to set up internally would be maybe guidelines around how far, because every freedom has its limitations but without restricting the choice that academics have. Because we've now embarked on a whole new process around decolonization of the, of the curriculum and all those kind of things. And it would be contrary to, to that if now, the, for example, Big Pharma just dictates uh, what uh, uh, happens in the drug d discovery uh, unit, for example. Okay? Not a very satisfactory one but one that one uh, would need to carve out some principles for. Research intensive university, yes. What we've done with the little resources at UWC was to actually circumvent, to top up what was lost in the NRF with the rating. And I think it's very important if, if uh, UCT is going to not only stay a, a world-class university, but also one would hope increase uh, and, and become more um, African focused as, as time, um, passes, then obviously, this is where I would like to get my hands dirty. That's why I wanted the financials. Um, one needs to look at clever ways in which you can make sure that whilst you are generating extra, or uh, um, especially on the third stream funding, that the proportion that goes to the academic project is not just determined by finance, but it should fund the academic project. And so the academic project should be first, and that finance should be an enabler of that academic project. So that's a conversation that one would have to have uh, with finance, whether the 4% that now gets paid over would be sufficient, uh, for example. And it's, it's, it's probably not going to be an awkward conversation also. Um, the, the, the next one is around um, fundraising, I think, is, is something that, that any vice chancellor should do. Because especially if you have, for want of a better word, such a product to sell, you should be able to pick up the phone and, and, and to use the networks of the university, but also to leverage the networks of people that, that um, can open the doors. And there are many of them at, at UCT already. And once you leverage that, is then to sell a proposal that can actually be funded. And I'm sure there are lots of those, but the trick is also to make sure that you don't alienate your alumni, because you want two things from the alumni, friend raising and fundraising. So not only for fundraising and also legacy, so you want giving from the alumni. And therefore you need to make sure that you take your conversa convocation with you, take your, your alumni with you in, in your funding um, proposals. Well done. Um, your time is up, but if I gave you two minutes and said, uh, tell us something that uh, you would really have wished to say if you had time in two minutes, what would that be? It would be that I enjoyed this process. And I've learned through this process, and I want to tell you, whatever the outcome of this process, I... UCT became part of my being because I had to learn so much about you. Um, I'm driven by one thing only, and it is about what kind of contribution can I make. I need to be able to add value. That's why, Prof. Andrews, I'm not on the bench at the moment, because I felt that my, my 
places here in higher education. And I feel with the, the experience that I've gained both in private sector and in higher education, I may be looking at UCT with fresh eyes and maybe making a kind of contribution that will make you slightly uncomfortable, but I'm a connector of people and teams and my track record speaks to it. Well done. Thank you very much, Professor Lawak. And, and uh, thank you very much, everybody, for um, very useful and helpful questions and interactions. Thanks to you. Cheers, Paul. Thank you.